Hey, good afternoon, everyone. As always, we'll give everyone a few minutes to uh, to join up. You can post your questions in the chat, the QA, or just use the raise hand function, and we will get to you. So um, we have one pre-submitted question uh, from someone. I'll wait for them to join. Hey, Jeff, happy, happy Monday to you too, sir. All right, here we go. All right, Scott. Oh, actually, uh, Murray is first here. Beat you to it. Uh, Murray's question, can you tell us if there are plans to include multi-tenancy in version 7 eventually? Yes, there are. Right now, the plan is to have multi-tenancy returned in V7 by December. So that puts us like around 7.10, I believe, something like that. But yes, we are working on it right now, and it is expected before the end of the year. Thank you. That's all I needed. All right. Uh, and to Scott's question, I'm bringing some additional people to the development process. Can you discuss some best practices for folder permissions? For example, should we add the developer group to the designer folder we are working on together so that we can both see the folders? Can you also talk about best practices for the repo server? Decisions is a little bit different than other source control since all the resources on a server are in a shared environment as opposed to individual checkout copies of the code. Uh, sure. Um, let's see. First things first is do we have, we've been talking about, um, let's see, permission, custom permissions, user pro enabling, help folder, portal permissions, custom permissions, limiting designer access to specific user groups. Testing, let's see, what is this? Once groups, permissions, and dashboards are established, if further customization over control is desired, then admins may limit based on their group user account. Oh, wow, this is very specific. Well, this is an example of that. So uh, yes, yeah, Scott, so let's, let's start with your first question. Best practices for folder permissions. Um, so uh, in our world, in the studio, we can, you have, you have user, you really have users, you have designers, and you have admins. Of course, admins have access to everything. Users have access to the end user portal, and designers have access to end user portal and the studio, but they don't have access, they only have access to the folders that you grant them access to, assuming you're an admin or that an admin does. So you could imagine that both you and myself are designers and uh, we have to be granted permissions to do work on particular folders. Um, so you could see a set of folders and I could see a set of folders. Um, that means, um, and then we can control the permissions for each of those folders individually. Um, uh, some examples we've seen are two different groups um, working together. They only see um, their individual folders. Uh, there's also scenarios where there's two groups working separately, but there's a shared set of components and they both share um, access to the shared so that each group sees their project folder as well as the shared folder. Now, what you can do is you can still use the con, if assuming you and I are both in different groups and we're only designers, we can use um, normal folder permissions. So we could come to a, a folder, we could go to manage permissions, and then we could add designers here. And we could add can use can open can view that allows let, let us use it and open it and see it in the folder tree and then edit add and delete will give us the ability to add and edit and delete flows forms rules things in and folders. Um, this is really what we need um, at a minimum here for the designer users to be able to add, add, interact with the renewal workflow process. Um, 
and then if I log in as a designing user, so do I, let me create an account for myself really quick, just so we can see a, a actual example of this. I do have an account, so I will log out. I think I know my password. I will log out and log in. Now, here I am, right now I'm an only a, I don't have any access to the studio, so I'm a user account only. So what I need, let me, and you can see I have a folder I've added for myself at some point, and then I have inbox. So inbox in my documents and then just recents here. So if I log back, let me log out and log in as admin. And let me add will at decisions.com as a designing user. Um, security groups, designers, add, remove account. What? Why is? Oh, I click add. Yikes. Add. Okay. Now log out. Log back in. And now. Uh, I am a designer user, so I don't have access to the system folder, but I have access. Looks like my apps had gotten designer access at some point. Let me, oh, that's not that helpful. Let me fix this a little bit. So look at what my apps has. Manage permissions. Get rid of designers here to make this view a little bit better. Log out. And log back in as well. There we go. And now I'm a designer user and I can only interact with the contents of the renewal workflow folder. So I think here, the biggest thing is constrain what I can see to what, um, to using folder permissions. Um, folder permission inheritance is on. So any folders I could create, inside of here or that are created, I'll get access to, but I can't touch anything else. So you can separate teams work from each other um, just using permission here. Now I can actually look at and use, so if I were to come into launch new renewal process, and maybe I was gonna put a um, run subflow step here and I would go pick it, I would pick an existing, I could click all and I can go to all. Um, And I can't uh, because, oh, interesting. I wasn't expecting that. I thought I would be able to use it. Maybe I can, can I search for it? Oh, we might've tightened that up a bit. So um, this way I can keep my, my, the build contents completely separately. What that means to your second question is now that um, I'm, I can only see these pieces. I'm actually adding them to separate projects and then I'm, checking only the projects that are in the folders that I have control over into the designer repository. Um, so, um, and, and in this way, we're not, um, you know, it is very, the work of one team is completely hidden from the work uh, of another team. Questions about this before I, I think move on a bit. No, that's, uh, that's pretty much where I had landed for permissions. So, um, were, were you going to talk about the repository then next or? Mm -hmm. okay. and, and really the, the thing about the repository is there's the same, it's the same concept is you can create permissions. And, and an example we have is a customer who has uh, a shared repository, but they have different UK and, and stateside teams. And we've set up the repository, repository server with permissions as well. And that way I can check in I can only see projects that are in the folders of the repository that I have permissions to. So you could create separate development groups, um, add users to those groups on the repo server. And so when I go to possibly send something to the designer repo, which I don't have connected, but I would come here design repository or check out projects, I'll only see what is, um, I'll only see the projects in the repo that my team has been granted access to, not everything. So folder permissions apply to the repo um, access uh, st uh, flows as well. Now, um, to sort of, I think your last question here, which is you can't, so it is true that most customers run shared development environments. 
Um, but there's no there's nothing that requires that you have to do that. You can be with a repo server run local, and, and very few customers do this, but they'll do what you would you say is more traditional, right? Where they check the code out to their local. They yeah. would then make changes and check it into the repository. You, you can do that with personal server licenses. So if you wanted the team to be more distributed um, and not on the same dev server, uh, if if they were to install decisions like onto their the local workstation, and then they can then connect to the repo server, they can then check the project out and then check in their project and then do sort of conflict resolution or commit you know um, uh, resolution using uh, keep local or override. You, yeah. you can't really the, the difficulty there with the current implementations you can't see the changes like you would in a normal source control where you can see who touched what and possibly safely merge them together if they don't touch the same thing yeah um you have to actually just pick a winner yeah uh, and so you'd have to actually review the work done by each team member say okay you did this you did that um you did more i'm going to pick yours you can't actually view it in any way we're right now we're working on enhancing that so you could see some sort of java like a, some, some what we're, we're, we're imagining right now, but it's still very much in the air is like a JSON representation of a flow that you could then use through normal sort of like you could run a diff on and you could see all of the differences, new step, new mapping, new X, Y, Z. But right now it's a, well, it's a winner takes all type of um, commit resolution um, uh, process. It, it, so you, yeah, go ahead, please. Sorry. No, 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 it's fine. That, that all makes sense. I think, um, you know, it, it's not necessarily so much that that I'm looking to distribute it out more. I think I think what we've got right now is fine. We don't. Um, I just wanted to make sure that I understood. So, like mm -hmm. the the current, if if we are developing on the same server, then mm -hmm. it's, it's really just one instance. Correct. Um, so you're you're checking in that instance to the repository. So like it, it may be a it may be a the the proper workflow may be. Um, uh, so at the end of the day, somebody is tasked that they're going to check in all the work for the day in, into the mm -hmm. repo. Sure, you can do that. But but that's the idea. I mean, it, it's not like you don't have five different people all checking in their work. It, it's really just one. It's one body of work that you're checking into the repository. Yeah. So it is at the project level, not the instance level. So if you had in the, an example on the screen right now, if I was working in renewal flow and you were working in you know, employee onboarding flow, yep. we would be checking in independently of each other. Yep. So it's, it's definitely at the project level. Yep. Now, it is true that it will be every modified object for renewal workflow would be pushed at the at this end of day checkout. But we do have in the re, in the checkout screens, there are settings that allow you to specify just the things you've changed. Yep. So you can, it will present you with a list of everything in the renewal workflow ready to be checked out into the repo. You can then scope that down just to the things you've changed and or pick the things that you want to push. But it is, but yes, um, or you have a sort of a daily end of day or whatever uh, type of uh, project right. level commit of all the changes. So there's a couple options there, but yes, it's, um, it is everything that has been edited by anyone in the current project that would be, that would show up as a thing to be sent to the repo server. For the current, for the uh, "quote unquote" current project, that was, that was and, really and I suppose in that model, it really is is the is the idea of a, like a daily push to the repository, then more change management um, at the repository level, because obviously, unless you're unless you're cutting a branch for production mm -hmm. or, or doing something like that, I mean, it really it really doesn't matter. So I, I would guess that the, the the primary reason for doing it would just be like change management on a, on a more granular level. I'd actually love, Jeff, do you mind if we unmute you and you talk about how you guys handle your code pushes from dev to repo? Um, Jeff actually is a, Jeff and his team are heavy users of the repository. How do you guys think about pushing from dev to the to repo? Oh, uh, so- if, I, if it's okay if I put you on the spot and ask you a question. No, that's fine. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Okay. Yeah, we we are we have a shared dev environment as you were describing. Uh, so it's kind of we have a smaller team. We have max six, a minimum two or three developers working on the same server at the same time, and 
we kind of make sure that we give our assignments out so that we don't overlap, um, you know, content areas of the, the project. But uh, yeah, usually what we do is we make sure that when we check in that we look for any objects that might be in someone else's list that we were working on to identify anything that might have been worked on by more than one person. And then we resolve that before we commit. You guys are very intentional about your checkouts then, right? Like viewing it against like whatever your your uh, user story or, or backlog item that you're working against. Yeah, correct. Okay. Uh, thanks, I, Jeff. I should, I should add too that we, we, we have one large project for our whole application. So we're all working in the same project, but. Right, yes, different, correct. Different yeah. silos within the project we assign between the developers. Scott, does that does that help at all? Any other questions about that? No, I think so. I think I I think um, I don't think there was anything too surprising there. Um, but again, just kind of a well, this is a this is a new area that that I've been moving into. So just wanted to make sure that I was I think doing doing what makes sense, and I I'm, I feel pretty good about it. So yeah, awesome. I think. Uh, the, the the thing is, if, especially if you're working on separate things, is ensuring those things are actually separate projects is the simplest way to avoid any kind of um, conflict and uh, and checking things into the repo. That of course only uh, applies when it applies. Like uh, Jeff's team has one very large project, but um, if you're if you have teams working on different sort of processes, then making sure those things are um, separate. Um, projects is the best decision you can make to keep things as um, uh, easy as possible. Great. Thanks. Yep. Absolutely. Happy to help. All right. To Jeff, your question. Um, so a question on creating data types, specifically flow structures, aka simple flow structure. The option include field and description. What does that do? What description is that referring to? Someone replied to this on Teams, but I don't think it was decision support. Said I should try it and see, but I don't know where to look for field description on Slack. I mean, okay, so field flow structure. Let me get back in as my admin account. I, I'm going to guess without knowing here that this might just be a place where um, one of our actual database persistent type settings is showing on a flow structure. So let's see here. So create data types integration, flow structure, include type name in, oh, okay, include type name and description. Oh, not, not that one, uh, on, on, a, on an individual field. On the individual field, okay. Yeah. So looking at advanced, include field and description. All right, I think I know what this is, and it probably makes no sense for this. In fact, it doesn't even really show up the same in seven, which is hard to show. But what I believe that this does is in six, if you if you select like a if you're in the designer studio um, and you have a type and you you select it, you've got that view on the right hand side. And you should have the description of the object that you selected on in a text view, like in the bottom right hand corner. And I'm, I'm fairly confident that that um, that setting allows you to include or exclude. So in like a, I don't know how to show this in seven. I don't think it exists anymore. Um, I don't have a. Uh, let's see. Let me create, and I don't think it makes any sense for a flow structure, really. So this is simple flow structure description test one. So str1, str2. So str2, I will turn the include field and description off. 
I don't think this is going to make sense. So this this should look kind of similar, but this is in seven, we have this slide out here, but on in six and older, you should see in the normal view like that right-hand pane. And I believe what it's trying to let you do is you can, by default, you get, you get that rich text-based description of an object um, in a report. And so you can imagine I have a, um, like maybe I have a, a property called, um, you know, like a, like account and account has social security number. And I want to exclude social security number from showing in that description field. Deselecting that should prevent it from, uh, from showing. Well, you can use my, my version six instance. I put my URL in the chat and it's default creds if you want to try to log in with it. Did it work? I don't have, I can't hit your IP address. Oh, really? It must be on different IP access points then. Yeah, it's okay. No All worries. Right. Jeff, uh, so I'm, pr I'm fairly confident. I can't really show it here because of the changes in six and seven, but um, I'm pretty confident that's what that, that setting is doing. It's just about a view of the prop of the object in the portal um, in the okay. rich text-based description field. Yeah, I only ran into that because of my, what I'm working on with my next question, but uh, I noticed that even the the data the data types that were created mm -hmm. a while back with using the you know the JSON snippet, it seems like the fields in there are sort of randomly that switches on and off. So I didn't know if that meant something, but it sounds like for a simple flow structure, it's not. Really it shouldn't do anything in a simple flow structure. I'm pretty calm. I'm fairly confident in that. Okay. Um, and it, it wouldn't have any, it wouldn't be anything about the workflow based use of the type. It would be like its view in the portal, which then assumes you're using the portal in some sort of like portal based view, if that makes any sense, right? It's not like the object as a, as a variable to be interacted with in the flow, but like you have a report of simple data structure data or something or a report of entities that users are interacting with in the portal and they can see or not see the fields, the field name and values in the description field in the portal. So it very much has like a user portal based context there, not the, not like a back end processing context, I guess, if that okay. helps at all. Yeah, that's, that's a good answer. All right, so uh, the question two is, I'm recreating several data structures that were previously created by decisions using JSON snippets in three, V3, V4. We created them with a structure name in the namespace. Because this can, yeah, we created them with the structure name in the namespace, for example, user info, decisions, user info, because this can cause compile issues on import or change branch. Some are using multiple flows or other data structures. Looking for any tips to automate swapping those out. Um, we did stop letting you name the data type and the, have the name in the namespace. That is for sure. We prevented you from doing that at some point, I believe in V5. How can you quickly swap these things out? There, you could try it. You could. There's a. This is something that you. I want you to test and not trust to to work. But there is a um, copy designer folder action that can swap types out. Now, in if it's flow, and I know you guys are primary flows. I think this works well for flows. For other things, it doesn't. For like reports, and it doesn't work as gracefully. But there is a option to copy designer project um, and so this so you're, you're creating a new JSON type for the existing type right with the appropriately the the, the appropriately or, or newly validated or like namespace where user info wouldn't be in the namespace as well yeah that's the gist of it I was actually gonna, gonna use the uh simple flow structure to replace them so um this changes the name to it but copies it i this is where the test copy designer project lets you specify a designer folder right i right click on a designer folder i go to copy designer project and then i can create a well this would be a new project but maybe that's okay because we could remove the project it's, it's going to cop now it's going to copy the flow I don't think this is going to work for you, but you, there is an option here in Copy Designer Project to swap type names out. So I could use an existing type. Um, let's assume like I have a project name, Renewal Workflow, 
and I want to copy that but change the data type name. In that, in like it's a simple. There's a simple flow structure being used named SFS deck test one. I can change that to um, you know deck test two, um, but I can't specify the type. And this would copy the flows and create the type and then redo the mappings for you, which then you would have to replace everything. Like, uh, yeah, I don't know. That, this is mostly about like forking a project to have a starting point for another project, oh. less so about quickly scanning through everything to swap them out. I don't think there's any quick win here to, um, what is it? Are you sure that's the one of the things we've added? Do you are you guys using um, exclude JSON objects from check ins? Um, that that could be a part of the code compile issue as well. If you look at your designer repo settings, we added one of the things we found a while back, um, but definitely not that long ago is is in designer repo there are. Um, there can be issues on code compile on checkout if you send both the JSON and the flow structures it creates together. So it might be worth a shot to explore if now you have all these objects checked in already. So uh, what we did is we added this checkbox and we said, all right, you know, mm -hmm. we had a customer who had a lot of uh, JSON created data objects and they were sending the JSON object and the flow structures it created together. And it would be fine. They would check in, it would throw a code compile, but we could then run a new compile and it would fix itself. And so the change we made is to set this, add this setting to design a repo settings to exclude the generated structures from repository. When this is set, we only send the JSON type. So it compiles itself, it compiles the flow structures it expects to be there. And then doesn't also ship the flow structures alongside so that it's not both trying to import the flow structure and generate the flow structure based on the JSON object. I'm okay. guessing a bit here, but this might be worth um, exploring. Because if I were right, and I'm not, I don't, I don't have high confidence that I am, we would then just need to remove the flow structures themselves from the project, which is a much easier activity than finding all of their instances and swapping them out for, um, for your newly created uh, newly created type oh, okay uh, i'm not really answering your question here but this could this might be related or or possibly another ex uh, explanation for some of the compilation issues you're having okay uh the, the error i'm getting is specifically the the uh the one about the namespace can't the, the object name can't be part of the namespace is that when you're trying to make a change to the existing type like in the data structure designer? No, it's uh, when we import and it, it does, it does, when you import, it compiles the things that you import. Mm -hmm. It, it uh, mm -hmm. doesn't compile these and usually results in a, like a few dozen objects that don't get compiled. So we got to recompile them. And then you re, but you recompile on the target system and it goes through? Yeah, yeah. We have, we have to, we have to do it a few times because there are some dependencies, but. Mm -hmm. able to resolve it. I was just trying mm -hmm. to fix this because the operation team thinks sure. that, uh, you know, not, not optimal. Yeah, I, um, I know there's no quick win here to get you to, to, to you could hunt down, you can use dependency browser to hunt them down. Um, maybe use flow structure report to identify the steps. Um, theoretically, we could work on a, like a data source to show you every mapping, uh, but there's no, I mean, if you go in, if, the, if it has all the same properties and the variable name is the same and you just swap it out, well, you'd have to do it on any step that was actually specifying it. Yeah, there's no, there's nothing we have in our toolkit that sort of like can let you programmatically do this right now. Okay. That's, yeah, that's, unfortunately. That's a valid answer. So, and I, and I am having good luck with, uh, the, you know, the de dependency browser and using the data explorer within the, the flow designer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, me, I think that's about as best as we can do right now. Okay. It gets me most of the way. There, there's a little bit of weird behavior if 
the data type you're swapping out is used as an input or an output of a flow. Uh, okay. It doesn't seem to pick those up. And then if you change the input of a flow, it, the, the calling flow, the parameters to this, mm -hmm. flow, they, they get they get messed up. But not, nothing I can't work through. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I don't think we have any any um hidden hidden utility here to make this not painful. Okay. Yep. Uh, all right. See here, uh, Joe's question: How can I convert a how can I convert a string of comma separated integers created by a string builder to a list of ints that a SQL query parameter would recognize as ints? For example, the SQL query clause where section ID not in becomes where section ID not in, boom. Let me copy this into the chat. I should have done that for the earlier questions. However, yeah, okay. So I, the, the real question here is less about converting an, the int list, Joe, than it is to, um, uh, it, it's a it's about how to query with a in list or not in list um, clause. And so our defined query um, definition steps don't support in list. So what we need to do is use a raw SQL step and text merge to, uh, to get this to work. You can't currently use an in list type SQL query or SQL um, filter uh, with a defined query step. Um, I'm assuming that's what you're doing right now. You've created a uh, database integration add query with a parameter for like where, yep. where yep. yeah, and so you're gonna you have to change your approach here to get your in list clause to work. And um, if I go into my folder here, I'll show you what I'm talking about. What we can do is if we create a flow here, is there's this, we have a step that runs raw SQL statements called raw SQL. And on this, we can uh, use like text merge plane. And you could have, um, do you you can have like a list say like a, a int list comes in i'll create like a list called um like you know product codes or something product codes is a list of integers right and then i could use like a join string step and i could join all of those with commas i guess this won't be no i gotta do I have to, I don't have to put quotes around these, right? Cause they're numbers. Okay. Yeah. So I could put like a comma separator and I could pass the int list in and then do um, something like this where it would be like, you know, select star from entity folder where I'll have to pick, I think nesting level is an integer property on, an, on a folder, nesting level in, and then I can, put in, I believe, join strings output. Let's just try this really quick and see. Just do zero and one. Save this as a test. So if I, if, so here looking at inputs and outputs that zero and one array comes in and I get zero and one with a comma between them. If I look at my raw SQL step, I have select star from entity folder where nesting level is in zero comma one. Um, and then do I get any outputs? No. So maybe what if I just do? Oh, well, didn't throw out exception. So that's a good sign. Yeah, I, nesting level, I've got to have some nesting level. Let me try this really quick. Let's get something that confirms will actually work right. Let me run that query here with the query editor. So select nesting level from entity folder. Oh, because ah, zero is not a valid nesting level value, I guess. Let's try this again. So we'll change our test here. Test one, we'll do one and two this problem you know let's just yeah that might not work either but let's try run this now it won't because nothing will have a one and a two now that should work shouldn't it 
That should work. Let's see. Let's oops. Let's look at our inputs here. Let's copy that query we just ran. Ah, oh, good lord. Well, I'll get rid of that quote. So that runs. Oh, I'm not returning data. Sorry. I'm, I don't have my step fully configured. Let me look at my raw SQL step. I'll select return data. Now, what you would do here is build a type. You could create a type and then have it map automatically. Um, I'll just say return type is going to be uh, data rows for now. Excuse me, where's that? Uh, I'll put return data, data rows. But you probably want to define type. So if, if you're fetching from a table and you integrated with that table, you could specify select type and then the table name as the output type and it'll it'll do the data mapping for you but if we run this again and run our test here we should get some dynamic data row data back which would be our folders in that list so anytime you have to use an in list type filter you have to right now you have you cannot use a defined query step you'll need to leverage raw sql so, to be able so to make those calls the short answer is to use a raw sql step mm -hmm. Okay, right. all right, I'll tell you that. But just a note of caution here, like you don't want to use raw SQL everywhere because it um it actually sends the literal SQL query over. And we've seen performance issues um, if you're building up a ton of dynamic SQL queries, unlike um, our defined query step, which actually um, handles, I for, I'm forgetting the name here, but um, in terms of like a performance optimization plan, SQL treats each of these as you as unique calls and so it has to build unique performance optimization plans so there can be in large data volumes where we're running thousands of sql queries raw sql tends to not perform uh that well because of the manner in which we send the sequels uh the sql is sent over as raw text okay if that makes any sense it does uh That's any other questions thing. about that nope Okay. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you for the question. All right. What else? Uh, what else do we got here? Anyone else have any questions? You guys can use raise hand feature um, if you don't want to uh, type a question out. Feel free. Nothing else from anybody today? If that's the case, we'll go, I think we'll go ahead and, oops, uh, go ahead and call it a day. If you guys are, have a question, just go ahead and you can shoot your hand up. Yeah, you're welcome, Joe, happy to help. All right, well, thanks everyone. I will right, we'll call it a day then. Have a great afternoon and we will see you at the same time tomorrow.